So the sun is out and I'm getting a lot of questions about sunblock. Should you use it? Is it safe to use? What should you look for on the bottle, etc. So here's my list of the top 10 things that you need to know about sunblock. And not just the what, but also the why. So we're gonna get a little bit into the science behind sunblock. Look, sunlight is important. We all know that. Being in the sun feels great and there's a good reason for that. Sunlight stimulates the release of serotonin, which has a calming effect on us and has, puts us in a positive mood. We also need sunlight to get our vitamin D. And those UV rays from the sunlight are actually good for some skin conditions like eczema and psoriasis. And if none of that matters to you, then who doesn't love the glow of a golden tan? But the problem is that the UV or ultraviolet rays in that sunlight also cause all sorts of other harmful effects to the skin. And that includes not only sunburns and accelerated aging, but also the big one, which is skin cancer. So here are the 10 things you need to know about sunblock. Number one is to look for both UVA and UVB protection. What's in that sunlight that causes the harm are what are called UV rays. And we divide those rays into the UVA spectrum and the UVB spectrum according to their wavelength. Now, 95% of those rays are UVA rays, but it's the UVB rays that tend to cause sunburns. So the bottom line is that both types of these rays affect our bodies in different ways and carry their own risks, including the risk of cancer. And they both damage the collagen in our skin, they destroy the vitamin A in our skin, and they accelerate signs of skin aging. So if you wanna be safe, you really need a sunblock that blocks both UVA and UVB, and those are the ones that are called broad spectrum formulas because they cover the entire ultraviolet spectrum. Number two is the actual SPF number on the sunblock. So SPF stands for sun protection factor, and that's basically the rating system that's used for sunblock. And the way they came up with this is actually pretty interesting. So SPF is the minimal ratio of sun exposure that it would take to produce redness, or basically a light sunburn, on the skin that is protected with sunscreen compared to skin that is not protected. So for example, if you have an SPF 15 sunblock, it takes 15 times as much sun to cause a sunburn when you have the sunblock on compared to if you have no sunblock on. That doesn't mean that you can stay out in the sun 15 times longer, and it doesn't mean that SPF 30 is twice as good as SPF 15. In fact, SPF 15 still blocks 93% of the damaging rays coming at it. So in itself, it's actually a decent level of protection for everyday use. And that's why it's often that level that's built into products like cosmetics. On the other hand, if you're gonna spend a significant amount of time out there in the sun, you need at least SPF 30. Once you get to SPF 30, you're blocking 97% of the UVB radiation. And if you go all the way up to SPF 50, you're blocking 98% of the UVB radiation. So all that to say that for most people, SPF 30 offers an effective level of protection. But keep in mind that SPF is only telling you about UVB protection. If that sunblock doesn't also have UVA protection, it's giving you a false sense of security. So don't forget to look for that broad spectrum UVA and UVB protection. Number three is the one that gets a lot of attention and that's the difference between physical sunscreens which use inorganic UV filters and chemical sunscreens which use organic compounds. Those physical sunscreens are usually made up of what we call mineral oxides, like titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, which is also why they're sometimes called mineral sunscreens. And they are called physical filters because those oxides basically form a physical barrier that reflects or absorbs those UV rays before they can hit your skin. So not only do they protect against both UVA and UVB, but what's nice is that those inorganic compounds are not absorbed into the body which means they have a very good safety profile and that's been looked at across many different studies. Even the newer forms where those oxides are packaged into nanoparticles have minimal penetration into the skin. Now the problem with these physical sunscreens is that they work by forming a physical barrier. So they tend to be quite thick and chalky, which can make them hard to spread. And they're also the sunblocks that have this tendency to leave a white cast on your skin. So from an aesthetic point of view, the darker your complexion, the more that whitish color will show. Now some of the newer formulations use tinted zinc oxide, which helps with this, but this is still the biggest knock on those physical sunscreens. Now the other category, which is what are called chemical or organic sunscreens, don't leave that white film behind, but the problem there is that we don't have as much information about their safety. Instead of blocking those UV rays, these sunscreens contain organic compounds which actually absorb the rays. For example, things like avabenzone or oxybenzone. And one of the problems is that when they absorb those rays, they can actually become unstable and generate other chemicals which can be harmful. 
And because they're meant to be absorbed into your skin, they are more comfortable and they don't give you that sticky or greasy feeling or leave that white film behind. But some of these compounds are absorbed too well and they end up getting through the skin and into our bodies. And the reality is that there are a lot of different organic compounds used and we don't have safety studies on each and every one of those. In fact, most of these ingredients are still under active study by the FDA. And the problem is that studies have found that many of these components are found in the bloodstream for weeks after initial skin application. What we don't know is whether those low concentrations in the bloodstream actually have any negative health effects. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. So at the end of the day, what we're stuck with is this theoretical risk of harm compared to the definite and proven risk of harm from sun exposure. So if you can't use a physical sunscreen, I still suggest a chemical sunscreen over going out in the sun unprotected. Number four is water resistance. So a lot of times when we're out in the sun, it's because we're also in the pool or the ocean or we're doing something outside that's gonna make us sweat. All of which washes that sunblock away, which is why the other thing you need to look for on that sunblock bottle is whether it's also water resistant. Now keep in mind that no sunblock is fully waterproof. So no matter what it says on the bottle, you will need to keep reapplying it if you're getting wet. But to make the claim that a sunblock is water resistant, it has to maintain its SPF rating after 40 minutes of sweating or swimming. And for the label to say that it's very water resistant, it has to protect for 80 minutes of sweating or swimming. Now in some countries outside of the US, you will see products labeled with as long as four hours of water resistance, but no matter how you cut it, you will need to keep reapplying that sunblock if you're getting wet, but the water resistant sunblock will give you more time between applications. Number five is quantity. So one of the biggest mistakes that people make is that they just don't put on enough sunblock. And the rule of thumb here will surprise you. It's anywhere from six to nine teaspoons for the entire body, which is as much as you could fill in one to one and a half 30 milliliter shot glasses. And how you get there is basically one teaspoon, which is about five mils or one good glob of sunblock for the face and the neck, two teaspoons for the front and back of your torso, one teaspoon for each arm, and then one to two teaspoons for each leg. Number six is timing. So you need to wait 15 to 30 minutes after applying your sunblock before you go out in the sun, and that's to allow it enough time to form a protective film on your skin. And this applies whether you're using a physical or a chemical sunblock, because it's not about allowing that sunblock enough time to activate on your skin. It's actually about allowing those tiny droplets to coalesce into one protective layer. The other thing is that you ideally wanna wait 10 to 20 minutes after you apply before you get dressed, so it has time to bind to your skin, which will make it less likely to come off on your clothes. Number seven is when do you actually need sunblock? So people often ask how much sun exposure is enough to require sunblock? And there isn't really a single straightforward answer to that because it really does depend on the person. So generally speaking, getting anywhere from five to 15 minutes of sunlight on your arms, your hands, and your face, anywhere from two to three times a week is gonna get you all the vitamin D that you need from the sun. So anytime you're more than 15 minutes straight in the sun is when you should start thinking about sunblock. And it's true that lighter skinned people are more susceptible to the effects of the sun, but the reality is that everybody is susceptible to those UV rays, so everyone should be using sunblock. And the other thing is don't be fooled by the season. Sunblock is not something to use exclusively in the summer. So depending on where you live, you will generally be exposed to more UV rays in the summer, but you will still have high UV index days in the winter. And because people don't feel hot on those days, that's where there's a higher risk of getting a sunburn without realizing it. And that can be twice as bad in the winter because you're also getting UV rays that are reflected off the snow or the ice. And it's the same thing on an overcast or a rainy day. The reality is that 80% of UV rays can still penetrate through light cloud cover and reach your skin. So what you need to do is to check that UV index before you go out and no matter the season or the weather, if the index is in the three to seven range, it's a good idea to use sunscreen. And if you're seeing a number that's eight or higher, you really need to think about a higher SPF sunscreen and frequent reapplication. Number eight is a word on kids. So we obviously worry much more about the health impact of any foreign substance in children because like anything else, they're more susceptible. So in terms of safety for infants, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends avoiding sunscreen altogether in kids under six months because their skin is less well-developed and because any sunscreen can be irritating and could cause an allergic reaction. On the other hand, it's sunburns in childhood that present one of the greatest risks for skin cancer later in life. So for the little ones, it's all about keeping them in the shade and using things like long sleeve shirts and swim shirts and hats. And remember, whether you're a kid or an adult, clothing does offer great protection. 
Different fabrics have what's called different photoprotective effects, and the tighter the weave, the darker the color, the less it stretches, the better it'll protect you. Some clothes actually have UV absorbing chemicals in them, and they'll give you what's called a UPF or an ultraviolet protection factor. That's not the same as SPF, but anything above 25 is very good protection. Number nine is a quick word on the environment. So one of the things we don't necessarily think about is that a lot of the sunscreens on the market right now are made from petroleum derived chemicals, which can be quite harmful to the environment. In fact, components of sunblock have been found in all sorts of different places in nature. And one of the specific concerns is that studies have shown that oxybenzone from chemical sunblocks can cause bleaching of corals. And of course, people who go snorkeling and scuba diving are often wearing sunblock. So this is one place you might want to consider a physical sunblock or a reef safe sunblock rather than a typical chemical sunblock. So for number 10, I want to end on a positive note, and that is to look into the future. So ideally, we would want a sunblock that has no possible negative health effects, protects completely against UVA and UVB rays, is completely biodegradable and doesn't harm the environment. Obviously, we don't have anything like that today, but there is more and more research into creating a sunblock that is based on melanin. Melanin is that natural component that all of us have in our skin that gives us our skin tone, but it also very effectively absorbs those UV rays. And cosmetic manufacturers have been trying to develop a melanin-based sunblock for years now, and although we're probably still a few years away, there may be a future where you can go pick up your melanin sunblock and choose a specific color that matches your skin pigmentation and not have to worry about any negative health effects or any effects on the environment. So there are quite a few things to think about when you're selecting your sunblock and when you're using it in your everyday routine. But at the end of the day, the key to protecting yourself is to make it part of that routine. Get to the point where sunblock is just part of your ritual when you're gonna spend time outdoors. For more on health and science, subscribe to the feed.